We're done with heavy coats and shoveling snow, but now we're up against grass growing, trees budding, and flowers blooming. Allergy season is here. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm your Prairie Doc, Dr. Jill Cruz. Now that the snow has melted and the temperatures are slowly rising, we are beginning to think of spring allergy season when everything is blooming and the air is full of pollen. But there are many other allergens that we encounter each day. We answer your questions about allergies as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Calling questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email at the address on the screen. Joining us tonight are two great friends of On Call. Remotely via Zoom is Dr. Tom Luzier with Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. And in the studio, at an appropriate social distance, is Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so Thank much you. for uh, being here, especially uh, remotely, and, and it's nice to have a guest in the studio. This is kind of a, a different uh, way we're doing this. I'm a little bit further than we're used to, but I think this will be a great show. So thank you so much. So Mark, uh, is there really an allergy season, or do we just have different allergies that uh, come at different times on the calendar? I think each allergen itself has a season. Um, if you're a dust mite, then it's all year round. If it's a tree, it'll be, say, three weeks in April. Uh, ragweeds, August, September. Uh, and we're just going into grass season now, late May into June. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, definitely uh, COVID-19 has changed the way the studio looks. Tom, has COVID-19 made any significant impacts on your practice right now? Uh, patient load or how you're seeing patients? Well, we are and absolutely it makes a difference. I think that uh, my patients that are um, over 50 are reluctant to even come to a physician's office thinking that that's where all the virus is going to be. And I think everybody was trying to just see how this all settles out. There's so much information and misinformation. I think until we learn a little more about it and get our proverbial acts together, I think it'll be a while before we um, uh, find ourselves in a more settled situation. Okay, definitely. And Mark, are you doing anything different with your clinic? Are you having patients come in with masks or what sort of uh, policies or procedures do you have in place? We're fortunate to have a smaller practice. Uh, I just do allergy, so uh, we, we're set up kind of spread out already and we have extra rooms. so. People come in with a mask, we, we're all masked. The uh, patients in the shot area all maintain social distancing. Uh, we alternate rooms and then let them get cleaned out, dry out in between. So actually it's, uh, I think, doing a lot of extra special things. Uh, and then the big change is that probably at least half of my day is on telehealth. And so it's much like sitting here, talking with people, trying to get the best exam we can get and uh, figure out how to get them healthy. Excellent, so it sounds like you both are, are kind of rolling with the punches, being flexible and finding ways to get patients in safely. So we really don't want to tell patients, you know, stay away, we're not safe. We wanna say, hey, we're doing what we can to protect you, to protect us, and to make this a, a good experience for everyone. So don't let this yeah. be a time to hold you back from suffering from allergies. Can you imagine having an itchy nose, uh, you just touch the surface where somebody coughed and now you just, uh, just and so controlling your as allergies does make a lot of sense in these days. Yes, definitely. I, I think yep. everyone's seen the meme where it's, do I have COVID or do I have allergies? Am I dying or do I just need a Claritin? So. That's pretty much what we're seeing up here. And, like, and, and first you get the look in Walmart because you sneezed, uh, what the heck are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Exactly, so. All right, well, let's start with some viewer questions here. An eight-year-old has a peanut allergy. What are the chances of her growing out of this or could it get worse as the years go on? Uh, you know, a person at that age, uh, if you've got a 
a true peanut allergy, and we'll assume that they've had symptoms with it. Uh, there's probably about an 18% chance that you'll outgrow it in your lifetime. Uh, kind of a nice thing that's been happening is we have a new treatment that's just rolling off after FDA approval called Palfrazia, and it's building up a teeny dose of peanut orally daily uh, to try to make it so that when you have an accidental ingestion, you don't get a terrible anaphylactic reaction. It doesn't cure you, you still have to avoid it. Uh, you actually have anaphylaxis occasionally from the treatment. Uh, you have to do it very carefully. Uh, it's a fair amount of work, but it makes it so if you forgot your EpiPen and you're at your friend's and accidentally ate something, hopefully things aren't going to be as bad. So it's kind of exciting that way. We wish that there was more of a cure and we could get that 18% to almost everybody outgrowing this. Okay. It's so much nicer. I, I agree with Mark with the, the peanut sensitivity. I really haven't embraced it because the uh, Palforzia has given us a standardized way to um, desensitize the peanut. And I think that's very important because we are using commercial uh, uh, peanut flour and this gives an, a, a very standardized approach. So if I send a patient on Palforzia to Mark, um, he knows what is being administered. It is expensive and it is time consuming for the allergist if you're a one man practice, um, because you should do a food challenge to make sure that they should be on this therapy. And uh, um, as they're what we call up dosing, getting on stronger doses, um, they need to be in the office, and I, I'm anticipating at least an hour and probably longer than that uh, multiple times. What do you think, Mark? Uh, it's every two weeks for 11 stages you are in having your little up-dosing challenge. Uh, we, we're expecting that some of the times you'll get a swollen, plugged up throat or hard to breathe, and we'll have to gut things back and build it back up. It would be some adjusting. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's so far, we don't know how well insurance will cover it, it's, but it is the only treatment that's FDA approved at this point. It looks like it'll be over $10,000 a year, though. Wow. So, what do you think about uh, uh, EOE and that kind of thing? Do you think that just needs to be, uh, um, just has to be shaken out? So he's, uh, Tom's suggesting what could happen with eosinophilic esophagitis, a, a strange reflux uh, disease that comes from a strange allergy, and uh, the, all these oral therapies have been, a uh, big worry has been that you develop that, and we're gonna have to really be careful and watch what happens with that. Excellent, so this is a, that new treatment for the peanut allergy is something mm -hmm. that you take at your allergist office. It's not something you pick no. up from the pharmacy and take it at home? Well, you, you'll start it at the allergist office, and then you have to do it every day it's, it's only indicated for kids. It has not worked for adults. Uh, and then you have to continue it forever is the idea. Once you go off of it, you're no longer uh, desensitized to it. And if you go off for very long, you have to start all over again. Okay. And I'm assuming these people are also the ones who would normally have an EpiPen with them oh, yeah. should they have mm -hmm. a bad reaction when they're yep. at home. Yep. Okay. And they don't get to, they don't get to, uh, uh, leave their EpiPen at home after they've started therapy. They still have to carry their EpiPen. It's just um, more protective uh, under these circumstances. So um, I, I think it's got some growing to do, but it does take the extremely allergic person and make him have a bit of a margin that he wouldn't uh, ordinarily have. Okay, excellent. So not a cure, but definitely a way to kind of damper, soften the effects of, but, of that, a very serious and mm -hmm. potentially life-threatening allergy. That's a great way of thinking about it, dampening the chances that you're gonna have a horrible reaction, making it just a mild one that we're more likely to sail through. All right. Yeah. It's kind of like the fairies in uh, Sleeping Beauty. They change it from a killing curse to a sleeping curse. So, all right, excellent. Well, we've got an 11-year-old, another one talking about uh, asthma and take Singular and Advair daily, um, is there a chance that they could outgrow the asthma as well? I know some people outgrow allergies, but what about outgrowing asthma? Tom? Oh, absolutely you can outgrow your asthma as an 11-year-old. Uh, there's so many uh, 
facets to airway reactivity and what causes airway reactivity, especially in an 11-year-old, everything from um, infection causing uh, airway reactivity, reflux. Of course, the thing that we see the most in 11-year-olds is um, uh, an allergy to some type of inhalant, either perennial or um, seasonal. Uh, the perennial being a little more important in that case. So everybody that we manage with asthma, we always make sure that they've had an evaluation of their allergy profile so that we can treat them more effectively and that kind of thing. And, you know, we have triggers. We have triggers like at night can be a trigger, exercise can be a trigger, cold air can be a trigger, particularly in South Dakota. So um, we do a lot to try to profile them to get on the ideal medication regimen. But absolutely, an 11-year-old, particularly if we can manage the allergic part, I can. I would anticipate that we could make them a lot better and have uh, fairly stable airways as an adolescent. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. So, if one has allergies, you are aware of the things that can cause a reaction. Food allergies are among the hardest to guard against and live with. So I'm anaphylactic allergic to peanuts and eggs, and then I'm also allergic to fresh fruits and vegetables. So with eggs and peanuts going to anaphylactic shock and my throat closes up, with fresh fruits and vegetables, I just get kind of itchy, like my throat and tongue get really itchy and I just get uncomfortable. I think the biggest one for me is just not being able to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Like I could have canned fruits or like vegetables if you cook them or anything, I'm fine with them but just I can't grab an apple or banana and take it on the road with me. Basically just something on the outside of the fruit. So once it gets processed by either being canned or cooked or baked or even sometimes frozen, then I'm able to have it. They're not really sure why my body does that, but that's just kind of what they told me. So I found out I was allergic to peanuts and eggs when I was younger, about one or two. My sister was having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I reached up on her tray and kind of touched it and I touched my face, got a hive. So my parents brought me into the doctor's office and they tested me and found out I was allergic to peanuts and eggs at that point. So I have an EpiPen with me. I don't have it on me, but it's just in my backpack. I always carry it around with me just in case something were to happen. I'm usually very careful. I don't eat anything that I'm not really sure about just to be on the safe side. And then, yeah, working with kids, like you said, don't really know where <laughs> their hands have been, what they've been eating. So I usually give them air high fives so I don't have to worry about that. There's treatments to kind of lessen the severity or like give me more time if I did accidentally ingest something that had eggs or peanuts. Um, but I don't think there's any real cure to it. It would just kind of build up a tolerance for me. So that way it would give me more time to get to the hospital. I donated bone marrow last May. The doctors, they asked me, tons and tons of questions and one that popped up a lot was about my allergies because when I donated bone marrow basically my immune system goes into the person I'm trying to help save and so they might develop some of the same allergies as me so they were very curious about that and that was kind of interesting that my immune system is going to someone else and they have to deal with some of the same allergies that I have to. This is your program, and your questions are the key to the direction of our discussion. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email at ask at prairiedoc.org. Well, we do have a few more questions come in while we were watching that. Uh, a gentleman from Flandreau asks, I'm in my 80s and worried about my risk for COVID-19. I take Nasacort and Allegra for allergies. Is it still safe to take these medicines now, or might the nasocort, which is a nasal steroid, uh, hamper their immune system? Actually, it's great to just stay on those. Uh, there's no evidence to show that topical steroids in the nose or down in the chest impair your ability to fight off the COVID uh, infection. So it's best to stay on that so you're not gonna be, have itchy nose and self-infect uh, yourself. That's good. All right. Well, very good. Tom, do you have anything to add on that with the risk for COVID with people with chronic uh, asthma no, he, or allergies? He, he's he's got absolutely, 
he's on the he's completely on the money. There's not any uh, increased risk for this particular medication with uh, with the COVID virus. Excellent, and that's because it, it acts so locally in, in just the nasal passages there, where it's not getting into the entire body system like like an oral steroid or. That's exactly right. I mean, it doesn't have the nearly the impact when it's a, a topical, and that's why we try to, in most of our therapies, try to identify therapies that would be uh, topical because they do have a lot less side effect and don't tend to have that systemic uh, um, uh, load that we would have if we were using a systemic medicine. Excellent. Now, I know there's a lot of patients with uh, asthma that sometimes do take oral mm -hmm. steroids when they get a bad flare. With COVID, has that changed your practice at all? With are, are you more hesitant to prescribe systemic oral steroids? Or if you need to use it, breathing is still the most important thing? I think the breathing is the most important thing is important. Uh, really, some history factors. Are we seeing a fever? Because most viral infections that are going to flare your asthma don't have much of a fever. Uh, if it does, it's probably influenza. Uh, there are some older studies showing that coronaviruses rarely flare up asthma, unlike rhinovirus or influenza. So uh, there's just a whole different presentation for these people, and you have to really tease that out. Uh, and then if in doubt, there, people are getting tested. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, a woman from Dupree asks, I have allergies, but I also have glaucoma. My Benadryl has a warning for patients with glaucoma. Is it really dangerous to take or can I take some Benadryl occasionally as needed? Uh, Tom, I'll, I'll put that one to you. Oh, that's really a good question. I mean, uh, uh, number one is I probably wouldn't choose Benadryl as the antihistamine <laughs> in a person with glaucoma, but it, um, using it as infrequently she's talking about, it should not be harmful. And really it depends upon how controlled and uncontrolled and uh, type of glaucoma she has. So there's a lot of factors in there and that's a great question for her primary care physician to tease out because the way she presented it, I wouldn't hesitate to use the Benadryl, um, but there's so many alternatives that uh, are not as likely to raise the pressure in her eye. Excellent. The, the non-sedating would be vastly preferred, so a, a Claritin, a Zyrtec, an Allegra would be the way to go with as needed in that patient and just about every patient. We shouldn't be using much for Benadryl. It slows down our thinking, our coordination, and anybody that needs to be able to walk straight and think you know, should try to use different antihistamine. Exactly. I also, I know it can cause some urinary retention yep. issues. It can affect the glaucoma. I mean, there's so much that it yep. can affect. I know, um, especially if you're taking it at night and then you're getting up in the middle of the night, it's there's always that risk of seniors. tripping, falling. Yep. I mean, it's, it's yep. yeah, there, there are better alternatives out there. Actually, a dose of Benadryl makes you a worse driver than if you're legally intoxicated, and the studies have shown that quite nicely. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. That is, that is a, a sobering <laughs> thought there. All right. Well, an 83-year-old woman from Sioux Falls asks, I often have a lot of itching at night. Um, questionable if that's from eczema. Is it okay to take a Benadryl or half a Benadryl before <laughs> bed? <laughs> I think we, we've partially answered that. <laughs> Well, you know, this is that same kind of uh, thread is uh, uh, when is the antihistamines, well, number one, a lot of itching in um, the uh, uh, eighth decade does not respond well to antihistamine. Um, she might do well with just a topical and making sure she's got a good emollient on to make sure that it isn't um, dry skin. Uh, because as our skin thins and our as we age, it does become more pruritic. And so <clears throat> adding a barrier is probably a better way to go after it than taking a oral antihistamine. What do you think, Mark? Yep, uh, topical creams and might sometimes need a little topical steroid would be preferable. Okay. Do you guys have a, a favorite topical over-the-counter emollient or cream here? What, what, tell us your beauty secrets. <laughs> I'm kind of a CeraVe fan. I, I like the ceramid. Um, it is a little bit more difficult to put on because uh, 
you don't put it on like you're frosting a cake, you put it on like you're polishing a car. So you really have to rub it in in order to get the ceramic to form the uh, barrier that you want so that you're not losing uh, fluid through your skin. Uh, the transpirational water loss is kind of what makes such itch and the emollient puts a barrier there so that you're not losing that fluid and stimulating the um, itch receptors. Yes, I know when I was a medical student, I worked with a very old dermatologist who recommended that people just use straight up Vaseline petroleum jelly because he said, pull up a bottle of a lotion. Your first ingredient is going to be water. Your second ingredient is going to be Vaseline. Why are you paying for watered down Vaseline? And I was like, well, it's so greasy and oily and you, I hate it. And he's like, you're waxing your car. You put it on you rub it in and then you buff it out and then you leave that nice thin layer to protect your skin so exactly what you're talking about there yeah well and you know they used to use crisco and lard before there was uh, uh vaseline and yeah. although you smelled like bacon it wasn't so bad yeah I, i've heard of that uh, old uh, trick from grandma's so I, I may have tried that on my elbows a time I or two you like that part. yeah that's that's good you yep. like that smell like bacon <laughs> All right. A 61-year-old woman has uh, the need to constantly clear her throat while uh, she's outside doing yard work and after eating certain foods. Could this be a symptom of allergies? Well, uh, allergies could cause some of the post-nasal drainage type of thing. Uh, you'd like to hear, you know, like with the outdoor type of thing, that there's a certain months that they're problematic and that they also have nasal symptoms. Uh, itchy, sneezy, they might have itchy eyes, uh, that type of thing. I have to say that an awful lot of people though who have that type of throat drainage and gut, it's more stuff coming from uh, below that they're getting regurgitated uh, either acid or digestive enzymes uh, and that uh, you start clearing your throat and you get into a cycle because once things are noticed and irritated, you feel the drainage, and then you clear some more, you cough. And so a lot of times reflux plays a huge role uh, also. So a lot of times you're seeing how much reflux, how much allergy, do they have a component of asthma playing here? Uh, there's some uh, dry uh, mouth uh, syndrome types of things. So it's pretty complicated. Uh, been, it drives people crazy and I have to tell you that the patient's not usually the one that has the patient come in, it's their family, uh, their spouse, this can't take it anymore. From that constant <coughs> okay. yeah. and, and they're not very good at hide and go seek with the grandkids. There you go. Yes. So now, how do you tell if it's reflux? Uh, do you do, um, I know you've got the little teeny tiny camera about the sa size of a strand of spaghetti that you can go down and look. Mm -hmm. Is that how you tell whether it's reflux or whether it's allergies or how do you diagnose mm -hmm. that? A lot of times people will have the, the rhinoscope mm -hmm. looking down. Uh, other times you'll need to do measurements actually with uh, getting a uh, scope into your stomach and some acid measurements. Uh, take a look that way structurally. And allergy would be done by history, but then big thing is by skin tests, looking at what objectively they're actually allergic to and does that fit with their pre the presentation. All right. Well, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about the skin testing? I know uh, back in the day it talked about, oh, you got poked with 50 needles. It, there's no needles involved anymore, is there? Well, they're still pokey. They're just not needles. They've been modified to be more like a, like a little footprint um, and uh, very tolerable. It's not horrible at all. Whenever anybody comes in for their skin testing, they're always like, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And uh, um, the skin testing, uh, the, and Mark and I, because we do this all of the time, the skin testing is uh, just has a lot of uh, nuances that makes it a little, you have to learn to read it and you have to use about the same pressure. But we, we have uh, the techniques that we use are very mild. Um, they're not hard to do extremely diagnostic, like Mark was saying about the throat clearing. Um, 
this is a good differentiating factor between whether this is an allergic person or non-allergic, and it really guides us in our in our therapy. All right, excellent. Well, we have a medical mystery here for a question. A caller asks and says, I often get an itching sensation all over my body, sometimes at night, but sometimes during the day as well. There's no rash or hives. Could this be allergies? Just itching all over. Uh, I have to say that almost everything that I take care of with an allergy basis has a, a rash with the itchy skin. Hives should have that, um, and so while it's possible, it would, it's less likely. Uh, if it actually was chronic hives like that, those are typically autoimmune rather than allergic to begin with also. Uh, and a person has to think about dry skin, do they have some endocrinologic disorder, is there something wrong with the kidneys or the liver, is there a neurologic uh, neuropathy type of thing? So that there's an awfully long list of uh, things other than allergy when you have the itch that doesn't rash. Okay, so you're gonna need a detective to yeah. dive into some more questions and, and ask the right questions yeah. to find out what's going on. And usually there's a lot of lab work. Okay, all right. Um, an emailer asks, can you outgrow seasonal allergies to pollen? Is taking an allergy pill daily the best way to help treat to treat that? Tom? Well, that's certainly, uh, that's certainly something that uh, it depends upon the severity and how is it interrupting with, with your life. And if you're able to get through seasonal allergy um, with antihistamine, that's what we usually recommend. Um, it's when you're a patient who uh, does not get through the season or has a perennial symptom such as dog or cat or mite um, and in the farther south cockroach. Um, those patients, again, skin testing really differentiates what um, we're dealing with and makes, us, makes our therapy much more effective. Um, I don't have very many patients that come in and say, all I'm using is an antihistamine and I do real well. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Usually it's I'm using four antihistamines, my nasal spray, mm. monolutast, and I'm still itchy. So there's a big difference between those two patients. I, I have to say that my favorite and the best uh, treatment of seasonal or any allergy is avoidance. Because if you are able to avoid what you're allergic to, you won't have any symptoms at all. Unfortunately, it's really hard to do that. Yeah, especially living in South Dakota if you're <laughs> yeah, allergic to, yeah. you know, corn pollen or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, my husband's always the litmus test for me. Uh, when he starts <laughs> complaining of his allergies, I know I'm going to see patients in the mm -hmm. clinic. So it's, it's definitely uh, that time of year uh, because he's already started dreading getting mm -hmm. the mower out. So, all right. Is he wearing a mask when he's mowing? <laughs> uh, when I tell him to? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there are a few areas in medicine that have more myths than allergies. Actually, we grow into our allergies. Genetics plays a big role into that, along with our exposures and infections that we come across. Actually, a positive allergy test often is wrong. There's about a 50% false positive rate. Additionally, soybean is one of those allergens that we often outgrow. Actually, uh, fatal food anaphylaxis is a real problem. Uh, some people talk about food allergy and they really don't have the same thing. They dislike it or such. If you actually have anaphylaxis, it's critical that we avoid at food, and we have epinephrine on hand in case of an accidental exposure. Actually, nowadays, patients with egg allergy can take the flu shots as the egg part is really out of it. Hives, also known as urticaria, certainly can be caused by allergy to food and other things but so many causes of hives aren't allergy and include an infection, uh, things like sunlight, heat, cold, vibration, uh, viral, bacterial infections, and autoimmunity. 
Actually, food allergy is more likely to cause anaphylaxis, more of a multi-system reaction. Nasal allergies are caused by things we breathe in, so it would be pollens, molds, danders, dust mite types of things. That is, unless you're putting the food up your nose. Local honey really doesn't do a good job because the dose of the pollens that you're getting is way too low. That's why a lot of the drops under the tongue don't work very well either. But I have to say that this is one tasty treatment to try. Sinus and ear problems are due more so to inhaled allergy problems plus viral and bacterial infections. The milk sometimes gets blamed because of mucus, but avoiding the milk really doesn't fix people up. The indoor plants have pollens that don't go very far, and we really don't have much for mold growing on them. And it's the stuff outside that overwhelmingly gives us our symptoms. Essential oils have definitively been shown not to help allergies and asthma. In fact, though, uh, essential oils are great allergens of themselves, giving contact dermatitis, rashes, and for most allergy and asthma patients, the irritation from the smell will further set things off. Well, I've got my team of Mythbusters here, so this is great. Thanks for both of you being here. So next question, an emailer asks, I have an allergy to mosquito bites. The bites turn into those huge red welts. I use repellent. However, if you miss even a tiny little spot, the mosquito will bite that area. I've been on steroids by my doctor due to infections happening. I'm so very susceptible and could use your knowledge to help treat the bites or prevent them in the first place. Any suggestions, Tom? Well, that's always a tough one because um, there has been um, and not a lot of data on <laughs> trying to desensitize these very special people to mosquito bites. Usually you <laughs> self desensitize after several bites, the amount of swelling and itching diminishes. Obviously, you want to try to do what Mark has talked about, is try to do the best to avoid. Don't go out during the time that the mosquitoes are biting the most, early in the morning and late in the evening, and have your repellent on um, and try to put yourself in situations where you're not going to get bitten. This is a very tough problem. There are not very many people that have it. Um, we have some other insects and insect bodies that uh, people get sensitized to and we've been we try to desensitize them and it's a very uh, a crude method of grinding up mosquitoes and uh, using the mosquito body um, and it's really the the uh, numbing that the uh, mosquito puts into your skin so you don't know you're biting them that you re react to plus it has some direct histamine release so I don't think this is the easiest problem to manage and uh, unfortunately, I don't think steroids are the best answer uh, for that. Taking an antihistamine could be helpful. Taking a monolucast, a leukotriene inhibitor, could be helpful. We have some uh, monoclonal antibodies, which would be extreme therapy, but maybe not as crude as uh, trying to grind up mosquitoes and desensitize to the um, uh, to the mosquito bite in this way. Uh, traditional allergy uh, desensitization. Uh, works really well for pollen and, and mold to some extent and certainly to perennials and uh, to unusual things not as good because we don't have good standardized extract. I really think the uh, uh, mosquito bites are tough because most people actually they're not allergic to the, the sting. It's uh, the anticoagulant, the patient's extra sensitive to histamine release uh, lots of studies have tried desensitizing or doing allergy shots, but since it's a direct release of the histamine, uh, there isn't the IgE allergy antibody to have it work. And, and so the, I think that's why the meds don't seem to work very good. And avoidance and then trying not to scratch 
Uh, you know, it's the scratching sensation you know, that people do that really gets them in trouble. Uh, this is different though than say like bee stings or wasps, yellow jackets. Uh, those folks, it's an IgE anaphylactic reactivity and allergy shots uh, make it so that you're so much less reactive, it, it can be life-saving for the majority of people. Uh, it's night and day difference for, for that type of venom. All right. Well, another question here with uh, someone that uh, is taking beta blockers for glaucoma. Is it correct that people taking beta blockers need to avoid uh, Flonase or those nasal steroid sprays? I don't think they really need to be very careful with the good old generic Flonase and Nasacort. Uh, some of the new, like Flonase Sensimist has uh, labeling that would say that some people's intraocular pressure might go up, it, but it's a whole different grade of uh, potency. Uh, and so those folks may have to have things checked a little bit, but it's an extremely minimal number of folks that have any bump with that. Okay, so a uh, caller asks, uh, following up that itching question, can you talk about candida skin infections? Uh oh, you've stumped the docs. Uh, the well, that it's you know, and and you as a family practitioner probably see as much uh, um, candida as anybody. Um, uh, you know, I see some of it because we use inhaled steroid and sometimes in fairly high doses. I do see some oral thrush and we have to deal with that. A lot of times it's technique. Um, I don't have in my practice a lot of people who have such low immunity that um, systemic candidiasis and candidiasis is an issue. I do have two of them and have required uh, IV fungus, some fungicides. Um, but they have um, a specific uh, T cell uh, immunodeficiency. So if somebody has a great deal of issue with the uh, mold, uh, candida, skin, throat, <clears throat> vaginal, um, sometimes we need to intervene and take a look at what their immune system looks like. I have a patient who has IgA deficiency that uh, has issues with uh, topical uh, infections with uh, candida. What about you, Mark? Uh, I really don't, Canada infections locally might have some symptoms. I, I wonder though if the, there, there used to be a syndrome where people believed that the yeast that just is part of being on us uh, would cause symptoms and that was found not to really be uh, the cause of a lot of those symptoms uh, probably 25 years ago. Uh, and so people don't do the diets and the antifungals like they did 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so, it, but right in an area you'd have that you had uh, the infection, say under some folds, it might itch that way, but you shouldn't get generalized itch. It's other fungus that would give the id reactions. Right, we, you know, we had that whole yeast connection thing going on and there was just so much uh, controversy. Um, you know, we have used uh, ant antibiotics uh, uh, so freely, uh, now doing a lot less of that, doing a little more stewardship. So I don't sit to see as much um, uh, symptoms associated with candidiasis and antibiotic, but it will uh, disrupt your GI tract when you um, are on antibiotic chronically. All right, well, very good. Yes, I, I remember hearing a lot about that, that systemic mm -hmm. infections mm -hmm. that people were concerned about. And yeah, it kind of seemed to be a little fad that kind of went away mm -hmm. after time. So I'm, I'm glad that you could kind of address that and dispel some of those. All right, a Facebook follower asks, uh, I have ringing in my ears. I do take several prescriptions. Are there food or drugs uh, that could be causing that? Uh, well, the most common one, you know, Bill, was non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They are, and people take a lot of those and don't realize that probably is, of the medications, is the one that's most important for uh, ear ringing. Um, my ENT person will call me at 
times when he's done an exam on somebody's ears are ringing and sees some eustachian tube dysfunction and wonders if there's some inflammation in there. Certainly there are other symptoms besides just ear ringing and ear ringing and hear loss or ear uh, and hearing loss is a lot of times associated with the um, Meniere's type uh, syndrome, um, which fortunately our, our audiologists are quite good at uh, diagnosing. Sometimes they can even help the people with uh, ear ringing. Uh, allergy not playing a huge role in that um, area. All right, excellent. A snowbird asks, if I take allergy medicine in South Dakota, but go south for the winter, could it be I need different allergy medicines down there? I think the allergy medicines, uh, you have to match up how bad your allergies are and uh, how potent they are. And if your main season would be just the olive trees in Arizona, and you're really very sensitive, you're gonna to have to treat that bigger and harder than maybe your real mild uh, aspen tree allergy up north. Right, so definitely if you have a grass allergy and you move to Arizona, it- They have grass too. They do have grass. Yeah. They pay a lot of money for that grass yeah. though, and a lot of water. Yeah, and you know, one of the treatments we do a lot of would be allergy shots, and people have to make sure that they get the southern allergens treated along with the northern ones, and then, uh, the allergists in both locations work together and you go place to place, you continue your allergy shots year round. Okay, excellent. So, and here's a very good question. Caller asked, I used to get Kenalog shots every six months for allergies, nasal and contact. When I moved, my new doctor told me that wasn't a good idea. Is this still something that's being done for allergy treatment? It, it's one that I heard of when I went to my first mm -hmm. practice and, and patients that swore by it. Um, what are your thoughts on the steroid shots every three to six months? We like to avoid getting diabetes for the rest of your life or having glaucoma, cataracts, having a joint get avascular necrosis and have to be replaced. And then there's the weight gain and the round face and the fat hump on your back that the Kenlog shots end up giving you. And so if you can be controlled with some other things, that's the way to go. Kind of our rule is if you need a Kenlog shot, you need to really get going on treating your allergies. All right. Yeah. So when someone does allergy shots, how long do they do them for? What's kind of this time commitment? It's over how many, is it months, years, indefinitely? Well, immunotherapy can be done by shots or under the tongue, and it's traditionally a five-year course. With shots, the last four years of it, it's just once a month, but at the beginning, it's twice a week. And for the tabs, there is some seasonal ability, and other times, you just do it daily. Okay. So it's a little bit of a commitment. If you're, say, eight years old or 10, just think you could do something to make you 70% less symptomatic for those five years and then enjoy another 80 years with far less symptoms, far less medications. It could save you, I don't know, maybe 20,000 Claritins that you would take. All right, well, my uh, older brother ended up getting allergy shots when he was younger mm -hmm. and uh, every time after he got a shot, mom took him to the store and they got a matchbox car. So it may have saved him 80,000 Claritins, but he ended up with a very large matchbox he did, collection. He did really well. He did, I think he, uh, negotiated that very well very with my nicely. parents. Yeah. So, and I also learned uh, uh, from him that anytime I went to a friend's house and they served something I didn't like to eat, mm -hmm. I suddenly developed a food allergy to that. Yeah. So it, it took a while before um, my friend's mother's caught on and called my mother to confirm that I was actually allergic to a very wide variety of foods. So, uh, but it worked while it, it lasted, so. That was my polite way of saying, I don't like what you're serving tonight. All right. So um, the big thing that I know everyone's thinking about at this time is COVID-19 versus allergies. Is there a good way to differentiate between uh, one and the other? Is there something that allergies, yep, allergies has this. If you have it, don't worry that it's COVID and, and vice versa. Tom, don't you think itch would be the big word? Itch, I'd go with itch. itch I would expect and, then, and the I, second, second thing, fever. Fever, okay. Yep. So fevers would be more the infection and 
uh, itch goes with allergy. Okay, so those right. itchy, watery eyes, you're not gonna see that with the COVID-19. Right. And the fevers is, you generally don't get fevers with allergies. You don't get fevers with allergies. It would have to be a secondary infection. All right. Yeah. COVID uh, offers a very interesting uh, conundrum because it, whenever we hear about some of the symptoms associated with this uh, uh, virus, um, like the sudden loss of sense of smell, um, Mark and I deal with people who lose their sense of smell because of the intensity of the swelling in their nose from mm -hmm. their um, allergens. But this is, I can smell something at eight o'clock and I wake up in the morning and I cannot mm -hmm. smell. That's a pretty good sign that you have COVID um, rather than having a stroke. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sore throat that they describe is the worst sore throat I've ever had that's not really typical of allergy. Yeah. It kind of is a smoldery, uncomfortable kind of thing combined with that, uh, with that itching. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, and we've just got a few moments here. I would say, um, do you have any last parting thoughts that you want to share with our viewers? Things that you have to get out off your chest here tonight? If our allergies aren't controlled realize there are a lot of things that can be done uh, nothing is totally easy and you know you have to put some effort in but there's a lot of relief out there for your allergies and asthma and don't just say i'm gonna have to be miserable right. you don't have to put the wheezy sign on your jacket got it so don't grin and bear it yeah. there are things you can do to make it better mm -hmm. ask for help Talk to your family doctor and mm -hmm. don't be afraid to ask us for a referral to you guys because you are the experts in this. You know more than anyone about this fascinating um, area of medicine. So I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that we have you guys to help pinpoint because if you know exactly with the testing what you're allergic to, it becomes a lot easier to avoid things. Yeah. So, excellent. Well, I think this has been a wonderful show this evening. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we can do the social distance, but at least have a live guest in the studio. It's been far too long since we've had someone here on set at the Prairie Dock. And uh, thank you again for coming in via Zoom. Yes, uh, you guys uh, were a wealth of knowledge, so thank you so much. We'll be right back after this. We feel privileged to have had the honor of creating a legacy of service through the Prairie Dock organization. It has been our desire and goal to share health information that is not influenced by marketing or sales, but rather is based on science. We started in the 80s with a newspaper article and expanded in the 90s with a radio show. In 2003, we started a TV program, and in 2010, we added our social media platforms. This has been a team effort made possible by many volunteer physicians and experts serving as hosts and guests. All of them are Prairie Docs. Thanks to them, we've been given the ability to pass the torch so that this legacy may continue beyond my time on this earth. Please join me in embracing our team of Prairie Doc physicians, each committed to this mission. Family physician Andrew Ellsworth, Deb Johnston and Jill Cruz, along with internist Kelly Evans, all from Brookings, South Dakota. These volunteer physicians and many others have in the past and will in the future serve as authors of Prairie Doc newspaper columns, host of our TV and radio programs. Thank, Thank you. you. Growing up, we all knew kids and grown-ups who were held back by their asthma. They sat out gym classes and sporting events, missed school or work over and over again, were up in the wee hours of the night fighting for breath, or seemed to make their own chest noises they got all the time. They got nicknames like Wheezy. Jump ahead now to 2020. Although we still continue with our traditional allergy avoidance and immunotherapy programs, inhaled corticosteroid inhalers and long and short acting airway muscle relaxing agents to treat asthma, we now have entered what is being called the biologic era of asthma treatments. Biologic treatments aren't the traditional chemical drugs we've been using for decades. Rather, biologics are antibodies similar to those we use to recognize and fight off germs. 
When designing biologics for asthma patients, scientists replace the recognition portion with a component that targets problem signals from our immune system. One family of signals or targets known as interleukin proteins come from T cells and tell other cells what to do. The allergy antibody IgE is another target. When the particular biologic is given, it circulates through the patient until it finds its target and then binds to that target. The result is to change the way our body works, decreasing parts of the allergy or immune reaction that causes us to have the asthma. All these therapy choices can be overwhelming. We now want to personalize each asthmatics program with the goal of control, meaning hopefully no asthma. It all starts with talking to your doctor to establish an understanding of your history followed by a physical examination. You and your doctor might then decide on several options including allergy testing, blood counts, IgE levels, nitric oxide breath measurement, x-rays, CT scans, or pulmonary function tests as indicated to determine what type of asthma you have. Armed with the knowledge obtained, your allergy doctor can prescribe the best combination of treatments to achieve control. And as an added benefit of control, we can hopefully eliminate the use of that old nickname, Wheezy. A big thank you to our guests, Tom and Mark, for adding their experience and knowledge to our discussion tonight. We have a request for all of you at home. If there's a subject about which you would like us to do at On Call of the Prairie Doc, let us know. Please send us your thoughts, either a message on Facebook page or an email at prairie.org. If you would like more information about the program or to see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook or visit us at prairiedoc.org. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. The urinary tract is seldom thought of until something goes wrong. Then we're anxious to get a resolution. Current urology treatments, next time on call with the Prairie Doc. Useful, scientific-based medical information delivered in a respectful and compassionate manner. This is what we get from the Prairie Docs. I am proud to serve on the board of the Healing Words Foundation. Our nonprofit organization works behind the scenes building financial support to continue and expand Prairie Doc programs. We thank the many health providers who volunteer their time to answer our health questions. Significant funding is required to produce and distribute video, radio, and print throughout the region. Your donations will help the foundation continue to offer free and easy access to the entire library of Prairie Doc health education programs. I grew up with Rick Holm on the prairies in De Smith. On behalf of the Healing Words Foundation, and on behalf of a lifelong friend, we invite you to join our mission. Go to prairiedoc.org and click the donate button today. Thank, Thank you. you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, 
Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swift Hill Communications.